Stockbridge in Edinburgh, an affluent corner of the city, popular with families and young professionals, known for its leafy parks and Scotland's oldest rugby ground. The Edinburgh North and Leith constituency is currently held by the SNP, but it is a marginal that used to be held by Labour. And the Conservatives have also been making big gains here recently. Their vote share went up by 11% at the last election. So what do voters here make of the man who could lead the Conservatives into the next election? What do you think of Boris Johnson? Um, I think he is uh, basically a public school boy who thinks that everything's just a bit of a joke um, and it's going to be quite scary if he's Prime Minister. It's a very worrying prospect. I think he'd be uh, incredibly divisive for the nation. I think he would get us through Brexit because I think he means what he says, but other ways he's been shown to be a bit of a clown. He's a philandering buffoon, in my opinion. Do you think he'd be a good Prime Minister? I don't really think so. Um, I mean, he's lied many times in, on TV and, I mean, a few scandals. I'm, I'm not a big fan, to be fair. Normally, when we go out filming, it's really easy to find a range of opinions that we do our best to reflect. But I'll be honest, here in Edinburgh, it's been hard to find anyone with a good word to say about Boris Johnson. And this matters because at the last election, without the Scottish Conservative MPs, Theresa May would have been unable to form a government. 20 years after devolution, we sat down in the Scottish Parliament to speak to SNP leader Nicola Sturgeon. It looks increasingly likely that Boris Johnson is going to be the next mm. Prime Minister. Would he make a good one? No. <laughs> in a word. He was... A foreign secretary with a, a risible tenure, he didn't display any basic competence or seriousness of purpose in that job. You know, Brexit has damaged the UK's international reputation in the last few years, but close behind that, Boris Johnson's tenure as foreign secretary has damaged that reputation. He seems to have had a political career where he's gone out of his way to be gratuitously offensive to as many people and groups as possible. So I'm afraid I don't think he will be a good prime minister. And I find it actually quite hard to get my head round that knowing everything they know about him, the Tories are even contemplating putting him into number 10. I mean, the Conservatives have done relatively well in Scotland in recent years. What do you think the prospect of a Boris Johnson leader would do? You only have to look at how uncomfortable Ruth Davidson is whenever Boris Johnson's name is mentioned to know what the Scottish Conservatives think about the prospect of him in number 10. I think he'll be devastating, disastrous for the Conservatives UK-wide, but particularly in Scotland. He's seen in Scotland, I think, as one of the, the principal politicians who are responsible for the mess that we're in over Brexit. The, the guy who misled people in the EU referendum campaign um, and the guy who now says he's prepared to take the UK out of the EU without a deal. And for most people in Scotland, that's a horrifying prospect. Ian Blackford caused a lot of controversy when he said that Boris Johnson was racist. Is he? I agree with Ian Blackford's comments. I mean, so you think that Boris Johnson's well, look, racist? Boris Johnson has made overtly racist comments. Now, I don't know what's in Boris Johnson's head when he says those things. I don't know what he's thinking, what motivates him, what he actually feels about those things. But if anybody, Boris Johnson or anybody else, makes the kind of comments that he has what done... Comments? Saying someone has made racist comments is, is, is a well, the, the comment say. he made about Muslim women looking like letterboxes, the things that so I people actually... people who criticise the burqa are racist? Well, you can criticise the burqa. Personally, I think it's up to women to decide what they wear and don't wear. But you can criticise the burqa without being deeply offensive. Calling a Muslim woman a letterbox or looking like a bank robber. Some of the things he said about black people, I, I wouldn't even repeat um, because I don't think it's appropriate to do so. So the point I'm making, I don't know whether he just does that for effect to grab headlines or, or if that is what he really thinks. I can't tell. But I do think people who are prepared to make comments like that can't suddenly throw their hands up in horror when people call them out for it and say that they appear to be racist as a result of it. The prospects of a general election are looking relatively high. Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> if there is a hung parliament, would the SNP be prepared to do a deal with Labour? I would want the SNP in Westminster to be part of a, a progressive coalition that 
could keep the Tories out of office. Now, that's not me giving anybody a blank cheque. It's about saying frankly and candidly to people where the SNP stand in that uh, picture. So you would potentially go into coalition then with, with the I, Labour Party? I, I said in previous general elections, I think formal coalitions I would be uh, not particularly keen on. I'm, I'm not Smaller parties often do <laughs> badly out of them. The Lib Dems well, uh, the SNP is of course the third biggest party in Westminster. I don't think we can be described as a, a small party even Smaller in that context, party. of course. Um, but I've already said I don't think, I'm not ruling anything out and out, I don't think formal coalitions is what we would seek to, to do. We've been trying to work with Jeremy Corbyn to get him behind a second EU referendum. Thus far, that hasn't happened. And Jeremy Corbyn, and I, I say this in all seriousness, if Brexit, if we have a no-deal Brexit or a, a catastrophic Brexit, all of the damage that is done from that, Jeremy Corbyn, if he doesn't get off the fence in a second EU referendum, will bear almost as much responsibility for that as Theresa May and the Conservatives. You say that you've been working with Labour. We've been seeking to build uh, what, what's your sense about whether or not Jeremy Corbyn personally wants to see another referendum? I don't think he does. And I think Jeremy Corbyn, and this is me again, it's a bit like Boris Johnson, I don't know what's in Jeremy Corbyn's head, but everything would suggest that Jeremy Corbyn, uh, however he voted in the EU referendum, actually would prefer the UK to leave. The real challenge for Labour now is to decide, because they can't keep straddling this fence or perching firmly on it, they have to decide what side are they on. Are they prepared to see the UK taken out of the EU, potentially with no deal, by a Prime Minister like Boris Johnson, or are they going to now say, given everything that's happened in the past three years, isn't it time to let people across the UK look at this issue again and make a decision? Talking of referendums, uh, mm -hmm. you've said that you want to have another independence referendum by May 2021. Isn't that leaving it a bit late? I mean, we'll be out the EU by then. Well, well, you seem to know more than I. I hope we won't be out the EU by then. Well, I mean, if Boris Johnson's Prime Minister, then well, the likelihood is I that mean, certainly well, becomes more likely. I, I agree with that, but as I've said a couple of times, and the position of Jeremy Corbyn becomes relevant here. I think the prospect of a no-deal Brexit has increased significantly, but also I think the potential to stop that happening if Jeremy Corbyn gets off the fence is also increased. But, but, but why, why the delay? Why? Well, we've got, we're taking legislation right now through the Scottish Parliament. We have to put that in place. We have, and I make no apology for this, we've been uh, trying to get to a point where people have clarity about the Brexit future um, and then they can make an informed choice. So I think given everything that's happened, the right time scale is later in this parliament. I've actually said towards the end of next year. There is a, a, a pro-independence majority in this Scottish parliament. Indeed. There is chaos at Westminster at the minute. Why don't you just press ahead with, with it now? Are you well, because you're worried that you wouldn't win? No, I, I'm absolutely confident that we would uh, win a, a referendum. We've uh, taken the steps to introduce legislation. I have said we will have the option of accelerating that. Uh, of course, I've also said that we will have the discussion with uh, a UK government at an appropriate point about the, the transfer of power that we recognised in 2014 it was necessary to put any legal uh, grounding of the referendum beyond uh, doubt. Uh, there isn't a UK Prime Minister to have that discussion with right now that is worth having the discussion with, but there's no doubt that the case for independence is stronger than it has ever been, and I am more confident, I've, uh, I was confident in 2014, I'm more confident than I've ever been that Scotland will take that opportunity to be an independent European nation playing our part in the world. Now, it's 20 years since devolution. Yeah. What, what grade would you give your record? Um, well, it's the 20 years, of course, have seen governments of different colours. I, I think, I'm not going to get into kind of silly grading, I, I always think that's a bit, you know... But what, 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 are, you, are you proud I, of I made, Yes, I'm very proud. Um, I made a, a major speech just earlier this week which, you know, set out what I think the record of the Scottish Parliament is. I think it's a good one. This Parliament that we're sitting in just now, in just 20 years, which in the grand sweep of history is nothing has become established as the democratic heart of our country. There are many things uh, from minimum pricing for alcohol, free personal care for the elderly, tuition uh, for universities based on your ability to learn, not your ability to pay some of the work we've been able to do in the health service, integrating health and social care, for example, these the ban on smoking in public places, a whole range of different things that wouldn't have been possible without having a Scottish Parliament. Is it also a time for reflection about where things 
could improve, where the government could do better. I mean, for example, looking at the Scottish Household Survey, satisfaction in education, health and transport at the lowest level since that was re re launched in 2007. What's firstly, going on there? Firstly, on your question, is it time to reflect? As First Minister, I reflect every single day on how we can do better, how we build on our successes. Public attitudes to uh, public services you will find are higher. In Satisfaction is higher in Scotland than in any other part uh, of the UK. And so why is it that the survey is saying it's the we've, lowest level? We've, we've lived through a, a number of years of austerity pressure on public services has been significant but if you take the health service not only do we spend more per head of our population than other parts of the UK we've had the the lowest accident and emergency waiting times the best performance than any other nation in the UK for four years but now, some waiting time targets are, are going down uh, as well, absolutely we've got a, an 850 million pounds waiting times initiative to make sure we're meeting waiting times targets but the performance of the Scottish NHS is better than in England Wales or Northern Ireland now I remember that famous picture of you and Theresa May when she first um, took power do you feel sorry for her um I as, as somebody in a leadership position, I know how tough it is and I know how lonely it is. And so, yes, on a, a human level, I can have sympathy with the position she's been in and it's been tough. And I don't think anybody would deny that. I've uh, at times, you know, like everybody else, I think marvelled at her sheer physical resilience in all of that, the ability to keep going. But it's also the case, and I don't mean this in a, a sort of nasty way, but she has, in many respects, brought the difficulties she encountered, encountered upon herself. Yes, she inherited Brexit, but nobody forced her to set the inflexible red lines that then made her negotiating position so impossibly difficult. She made key choices along the way that resulted in her being where uh, she is. So personally, yes, you know, I can feel sorry for her on a human level, but politically, I think she has to take a lot of the responsibility for the mess that we're now in. Do you think it's been harder because she's a female leader? I, I think, undoubtedly, in some ways, yes, probably. I, I think, and you know, I, I maybe take me some time to properly looking back, reflect on these kind of things, but I do think women in leadership positions are are judged differently. I think often, you know, I think about some of the language uh, anonymously uh, quote and anonymous quotes that were used about her, which were very, very violent, for example. I, I don't think that would have necessarily happened with a, a male prime minister. So, yes, I do think it's different. But at the end of the day, you know, we're in these jobs and we have to take the responsibility that comes with them. Um, just finally, before you go, um, I'm keen to ask you about the Women's World Cup. I can see the <laughs> picture uh, in the office of uh, the Scottish team. Who are you going to be supporting now that Scotland are out? Oh, for goodness sake, give me just at least 24 hours. I know this is going out on Sunday, but this is a couple of days. It is the morning it's a after. Moment, I know. This is the day after, uh, the night before. Um, you know, can I just say, first of all, it was heartbreaking uh, for Scotland last night, but. Our, our women's team have really done such a great amount to put pride back into Scottish football. This has been Scotland's first World Cup in 21 years. Um, we've scored brilliant goals. We've played some amazing football, notwithstanding the results. I'm really proud of that young, talented, passionate team. I'm the patron of the team, so I've got to know them a, a little bit in recent times. And I feel gutted for them, but I feel really proud of them as well. And I think that team's going to go much further in the future. Which was a way of dodging the question, who yeah. am I supporting? Um, obviously, when I was out in Nice for the, the England-Scotland match, uh, I was staying in the same hotel as the Lionesses, uh, so, <laughs> you know, um, I, I don't know. Let's see. I wish England well, obviously I do, but asking uh, a Scottish person the morning after we've uh, been put out of a World Cup to see, which I think is what you're trying to get me to say, <laughs> that I'm going to support England, just just be a bit gentler on me than that, please. Are you going, are you going to be asking for a referendum on VAR? <laughs> Look, I tell you, I, I don't even understand VAR fully, VAR fully but... I hate it um, after, <laughs> after that. I think, genuinely, we, I think we suffered unfairly from a lot of awful refereeing decisions. Um, we lost a, a pretty dodgy penalty against England in the first game. Uh, but that, these kind of things happen. I think the thing for me watching as uh, just an observer is, is not the, the VAR decisions, it's the inconsistency of it. We've had penalties denied that were awarded against us in other games. So anyway, I don't want to start sounding that we was robbed, but it kind of was <laughs> a bit. you were. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you.